Hello everybody and welcome back to the United Stand. On today's video, we are joined by our good friend here at the United Stand. We have Ben Jacobs on the channel. Ben, thank you so much for taking time out to speak to us today. Great to be back as ever. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Well, I'm doing good. Man United aren't doing great. We're hoping we're going to get some good news off of you here today. But starting first and foremost, a question that is going doing the rounds now with Manchester United fans and in the media is if Eric Ten Hag will still be in a job in Manchester United come next season. How likely do you think it is that Ineos move on Eric Ten Hag? And is that something that they're looking to do or are they looking to stick by him at the moment? At the moment, it's just succession planning, which is different to interviewing any of the candidates that perhaps we hear linked. So Eric Ten Hag has no guarantees, but also his fate in his own hands. And between now and the end of the season, Ten Hag can prove himself. And then in the summer, there'll be a strategic review. So nothing is definite yet. We hear many names linked with the Manchester United job, but it's kind of false that they're either having interviews or there is a job to be offered at this stage. So the thing I think, fans need to wrap their head around is you can both back Ten Hag and want it to work and decide in the summer and at the same time succession plan. Brighton a succession planning in case De Zerbi goes they want him to stay. Chelsea a succession planning in case Pochettino goes they want to try and make it work. Manchester United don't want managerial limbo so they have to do their due diligence as part of a strategic process but Eric Ten Hag is not worried at this point that they are actively recruiting. So for now, Ten Hag's job is safe, but we can't 100% say that he'll be the next Manchester United manager next summer either. It's between now and the end of the season and maybe the early part of the summer for all parties to determine what direction they want to go in. But right now, Manchester United are hoping that it does work with Eric Ten Hag. In terms of Sir Jim and Ineos, they're obviously doing an audit of the whole club. I assume the manager is one of the last things that they're going to look at and they're looking at everything else above him first. That's what we've been told. Yeah, building from the top down, which is different perhaps to Manchester United in years gone by after Sir Alex Ferguson, where the manager got scapegoated. And the problem if the manager gets scapegoated, and this is the case with Ten Hag as well, is what do other players, unhappy with game time, unhappy with structure, unhappy with culture, if each player has a gripe hypothetically and they know that the manager is likely to go they can either force the manager out or they can wait and bide their time and then see what it's like under the next manager and the next manager and the next manager and clubs that operate that way tend to have weak foundations whereas what Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos are thinking and trying to do is build from the top so number one you bring in Omar Barada the CEO is going to be across everything then with his input, allowable and informal, because he is still on gardening leave until the summer, you start to think about sporting director, you get Dan Ashworth. When he finally comes in, he will have his own idea on the recruitment side. He works closely with Barada. Foundations start to be built. Jason Wilcox will eventually come in. It's a matter of when, not if, with both Wilcox and Dan Ashworth. So suddenly you have foundations, you have a different structure, some new titles, plus a little bit of continuity because John Murta will ultimately leave a handover. And on top of that, it's clear that the club would like Darren Fletcher to stay, but just with a new title. So after that transition period is over and stronger foundations are built, then the football side will be reviewed and into next season or potentially still this summer, higher standards will be set, more scrutiny will be put on the football side. And why are there problems? Why can't Manchester United challenge for titles? How long do they need? How many windows? Who are the right people on the football side, on the personality side, on the culture side? Who basically is a strategic fit? And if you make that decision too quickly before your foundations are built, then you might have to do it again and again and again. And that can set the football club back on the football field. And that's kind of what Chelsea did. They came in really quickly. A lot of people left. Not that many senior people joined. Graham Potter ended up replacing Thomas Tuchel. And what happened? He didn't last long. Now Pochettino's come in and perhaps Chelsea will take a bit more time and give Pochettino another season to make sure that they build 
in a way from the top down and they think about foundations and strategy before they think about football because that is the recipe for success. And I think that's Ratcliffe and Ineos's thinking, which is why there is this realistic possibility that Ten Hag will be given next season. Interesting stuff, interesting stuff. I mean, Eric Ten Hag, safe for now, and he's obviously got the FA Cup, which is going to be huge. But in terms of when you talk about looking at the long-term plan and, and, and looking at what would we do if Ten Hag was to depart, there has been talks about shortlist of potential candidates. Do you know any names that are on that shortlist for us? I think it's a long list. And that, again, is an indication that Manchester United are succession planning and not actively starting any process. So the links with Southgate are easy to make because he worked with Ashworth at the FA, but I'm not actually aware of any contact between Southgate and Manchester United at this point. And personally, I think that they would look at other names because if they're going to make a change this summer, Southgate's not available to start on day one of the summer and he's not determined his own future anyway. So if you approach Southgate, the answer that you're going to get is let's wait and see what happens after the Euros. Because if it all goes according to plan, I would expect Southgate to stay on and manage England for the 2026 World Cup. He's also been out of club football for quite some time. So that would be a massive risk. Whereas with somebody, for example, like Graham Potter, you would expect Ineos to look. Not a name that would necessarily excite Manchester United fans based on what happened at Chelsea. Maybe slightly more popular and someone that fans could warm to if he had hypothetically joined Manchester United from the highs of his Brighton tenure. But reputationally, he's taken a bit of a step back because he couldn't handle that Chelsea dressing room, albeit under very challenging circumstances. But the reason why I mentioned Potter is because Ineos as a group really liked Potter and they looked at Potter with a view to Nice. So does he have the pedigree and can he convince Ineos if there was a vacancy that he could step up and manage that Manchester United dressing room? Maybe not, it has to be said. But I do think people understand that Chelsea was a very, very difficult job and there were mitigating circumstances why it didn't work. He had an absolutely ridiculous size dressing room to the point where some of the players, when they were training at Cobham, couldn't even go in the main dressing room. They had to go in the hallways to change. And when you have 33 plus in your senior squad, all relatively big stars, they can't all train together. You can't just do an 11 versus 11 because you've got 11 players sitting on the sidelines saying, why am I not part of that 11 versus 11? So it was difficult for Potter, but I'd expect him to come under consideration. I would also imagine, even though there's been no contact, that Julian Nagelsmann will be discussed. If Ruben Amarim doesn't go to Liverpool, you again would expect him to come under consideration. But I think it's unlikely that Manchester United would make an approach for Amarim. Zinazine Zidane will almost certainly be on the long list, if you like, as part of their succession planning. So there's a lot of names that will come under consideration, Roberto De Zerbi included, no doubt. But right now, nothing is concrete because they're just working out who's out there in the market. And I think we need to understand what succession planning is. It's not saying who are we ranking. It's not saying who's going to get an interview. And it's not saying who's going to make your shortlist. It's a long list of names to understand the following. Number one, how do they score data-wise in terms of their experience, in terms of their style, in terms of their role in recruitment, in terms of their philosophy, to establish using data who might be a fit football, strategic and cultural at Manchester United. When you've done that, you start looking at their personality, you start looking at do they get involved in the pitch. So everyone talks about you have to operate within a model in recruitment. And you don't want a manager that wants complete autonomy, not under INEOS, as far as I'm aware. No manager is going to be given carte blanche in recruitment. But once you've established the target, you want to know that the manager's invested in the pitch. So what lengths do they go to to try and sign an already established target? And that will be looked at as well. And then once they've shortlisted using data to determine those aspects, the names they like, they'll start to understand, might they be keen, might they be available, and how much might they cost? And then you stop it there, because you may go no further, because Eric Ten Hag may stay at the football club. So in terms of, right, as we speak right now, we're nowhere near close to an interview stage with potential candidates. 
not as far as I'm aware, because there's not a vacancy. Eric mm -hmm. Ten Hag's got his fate in his own hands. And if Eric Ten Hag learned that there was a vacancy and anything being done was anything more than just general long list succession planning, then he would lose his relationship and potentially even his trust with Sir Jim Ratcliffe and his team. Because what Ten Hag's been told is there's no 100% guarantee that you're staying at this football club, but your fate remains in your own hands. Interesting stuff. I mean, in terms of the transfer market, would Ineos trust Eric Ten Hag in the transfer market or are they constructing and scouting their own shortlist? I know their ideal recruitment team isn't in place yet, but into how much say will Eric Ten Hag have or are they going to try and maybe construct their own sort of scouting team to, to do business this season? I think it's a model and I think when you have a model as we've seen at Nice and Lausanne as well, the manager will not have any autonomy. So it's not a case of trusting or not trusting Ten Hag, it's the other way around. Ten Hag has to trust the model and if he can't adapt to it, then he won't stay at the football club even if he does succeed on the field. And that was kind of the problem with Thomas Tuchel who won the Champions League. If you only judged him in football terms, he had every right to stay at Chelsea but he wasn't a fit with the model. So this is about either Ten Hag or a hypothetical replacement adapting to how Ineos want to do business. And that will be collaborative, that will be data-driven, that will have a freedom to challenge, but it won't have any one name, including the manager, that has a final say. It will ultimately be about Dan Ashworth leading and listening to others and then collaboratively determining who the right targets are which means that if the manager was to, as we've seen historically at Manchester United, change far more regularly than under the Alex Ferguson era, you're protected. If you give too much power to the manager in recruitment and trust his or her decision-making, then you get to a point where if that manager leaves, either due to negative or even positive circumstances because they get poached by another club, you're left in the lurch a little bit. So the model has to be able to survive managers changing. And that's why Ten Hag won't be given autonomy. He won't be given veto. He won't be given final say. He'll simply be a leading voice, an important voice in a collaborative model that when it gets to final decision making, we'll probably have six or seven senior people, including Ten Hag, making that final determination, which means ultimately Ten Hag has to accept that way of doing things. And compared to now, because there's new people with new titles coming in as well, it will be far more structured. And Either Ten Hag will feel that's beneficial because he trusts the model, he trusts the process, and he focuses on the football and the coaching a bit more, or he won't like it and he won't stay, even if he does succeed. I think that scenario is unlikely because he seems, from what I'm told, quite impressed by the pitch he's been given and the model that has been outlined to him. But only time will tell because right now, Dan Ashworth hasn't started, Omar Barada hasn't started, Jason Wilcox hasn't started, Darren Fletcher doesn't know what his next title is, and Eric Ten Hag doesn't know whether he's definitely staying. And this is why Manchester United are kind of in limbo at the moment, a sort of positive limbo in many ways, because next season we'll hopefully start to see the progress on the football field, but limbo nonetheless. In terms of the, the team that they're building behind the scenes, especially in terms of recruitment, do we know a time frame on how long it will be until Jason Wilcox and Dan Ashworth are able to start at Manchester United? I would expect Wilcox to be in place for the summer. I think Manchester United are really optimistic about that. And if you get Wilcox for the summer and then Barada starting, they can be a little bit more bullish with Ashworth. So if we take them one by one, Barada's really easy, amicable relationship with Manchester City. He starts in the summer. Simple as that. Huge appointment, marquee appointment, because he's best in class. And I think to get him from the other half of Manchester is a phenomenal and discreet bit of business. Then regarding Wilcox, Southampton want well in excess of 12 months salary in compensation. And that might sound a lot, but we're not talking millions and millions like with Dan Ashworth. We're talking hundreds of thousands. A sporting director at a championship club like Southampton is unlikely to be earning more than roughly half a million quid a year. So if you doubled the 12-month offer to 24 months, you're still only up at around a million, which is why I would expect a deal to be reached sooner 
rather than later. But Southampton's argument is even though Manchester United made a formal offer, when they asked to speak to Wilcox, sources at Southampton indicate even though Manchester United stressed very firmly they were respectful, that Manchester United said in writing they would speak to Wilcox and be allowed to on the premise that they would offer above 12 months of his salary in compensation. And then they subsequently only offered 12 months in compensation. And Southampton are a little bit irked by that, especially in light of the fact that the offer was made right in the run into the end of a season where Southampton is still in the automatic promotion picture. And at the same time, Manchester United, Southampton argue anyway, went against their written word. Manchester United argue slightly differently that they made a formal offer, a respectful offer. He's only been at the club nine months. 12 months in compensation is more than fair. But you would eventually expect it to be in nobody's interest to let this drag out. The other thing I would say is if you want Wilcox in the summer, it's important to understand that he's already on his working notice of 12 months. So if they're happy to let this linger for a few weeks, then he's worked out one month of his 12 months. If you let it linger towards the end of the season in May, he's worked out two months. So then if Manchester United come back towards the end of May and say, now our offer is still 12 months, but two months of his working notice has passed, it's technically an even better offer because the 12-month offer was made to be equated to 12 months of notice. So if he's only got 10 months of notice left and you still make 12 months, then that technically is a better offer, even though it's still only the same amount. So I think eventually Southampton will realise they don't want Wilcox just to be on a working notice or potentially put on gardening leave. Manchester United may go slightly above 12 months. The parties will come to an agreement and Wilcox will end up starting this summer. That's Manchester United's feeling. They're quite optimistic about the situation. And I think eventually that one will get resolved in the next days or weeks. And certainly by the time we get to the end of May. But it wouldn't surprise me if that gets done in the month of April. With Dan Ashworth, once Newcastle have determined who their next sporting director is, things should also move a lot quicker because it's not in Newcastle's interest to be paying Dan Ashworth whilst he's on gardening leave and then be paying a new sporting director as well. So I think even though there's been no progress on that one, it's still a matter of when, not if. But Manchester United are prepared to wait. So it's unlikely that Ashworth will start during the summer. Manchester United won't need him to start during this summer either, providing they get Wilcox and with Barada starting. And the priority for Manchester United is basically to make sure that Ashworth doesn't miss two windows and see out the full gardening leave. They're prepared to wait if they have to, but in an ideal world, the summer window will pass and maybe early September or certainly by the end of this year, in time for January 2025, Ashworth will be able to start. And that means they won't pay anywhere near 20 million. They'll have their structure in place and Ashworth won't be able to influence this summer, but will be able to start planning for 2025. And as long as they get Wilcox before that, and Barada hits the ground running and Fletcher will have a new title if he agrees to stay at the club, which Manchester United are very hopeful on, then the structure will start to be in place. And it won't be contingent on Ashworth starting right away. And Manchester United will feel then that the transition into this new Ineos-led ownership on the sporting side has progressed very nicely. So if I had to predict, I would say Wilcox will start this summer. We know Barada is starting this summer and it wouldn't remotely surprise me if Ashworth is in place well before the January 2025 window and then Manchester United will be in a really, really strong position to hit 2025 from a recruitment perspective running. Thank you very much for that, Ben. Very nice, clear update for us. So thank you for providing us with that. Let's move on to transfers. And speaking about the recruitment team, let's move on to transfers. We know what Manchester United's priorities are for this summer. But what came up earlier in the news today, which I wanted to ask you about, was Jeremy Frimpong, £34 million release clause from Bayer Leverkusen, has been linked to Manchester United quite a lot. Apparently, Man United have made contacts and are interested. Is there much in this deal? And also reports that Wambasaka might leave the club. Could you see that as a potential one for Manchester United? I think it's a possibility. One thing I can say is Frimpong is likely to leave Leverkusen. Congratulations to them. Mm -hmm. An amazing story winning their first ever Bundesliga. And with Jambi Alonso staying, it might change the dynamic a little bit. I did an exclusive interview late last year with Fernando Caro, the Leverkusen CEO. And he basically told me that 
Leverkusen would like to maximum lose two players and they've got a lot who are in demand mm-hmm. and if I had to rank likely exits from Leverkusen I would put Frimpong very very high whereas maybe some other names like Hincape linked with Liverpool nothing really in that Tar linked with Manchester United not a massive amount in that certainly not since Sir Jim Ratcliffe has come in whereas with Frimpong he's eyeing the Premier League. So there is a possibility there, as you say, there's a release clause as well, which makes things a little bit easier. And he falls into that category of players that is under 40 million quid. And there's two ways that Manchester United are looking at signings. One is who they want. And two is who's available at market value and who is affordable. So when we hear Manchester United, for example, linked with Victor Osiman or Evan Ferguson, great, of course players much like Harry Kane last summer that Manchester United would love at value, but can they afford them? And the answer is probably no at this point, not unless they bring in 100 million plus in outgoings. Whereas if they're looking at a signing or a couple of signings, like at the beginning of last summer, Mason Mount, Andre Anana, can you bring two in for maximum 100 million or under 100 million? And from what I'm told, Ineos are looking at the lower hanging fruit, financially speaking, that may be available due to release clauses or may be available at bargains or may be available collectively to get to in under 100 million. So they can move early in the window and then the rest will probably depend more on outgoings because Manchester United may well not have Champions League. It's obviously unlikely, but not entirely impossible mathematically. We might, we might not even have Europe at this rate then. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is true and it's unfortunate, but it's tight, isn't it? And if fifth place was to get Champions League, you just never know. But they'll be budgeting, forgetting football and ambition, they'll be budgeting without Champions League football. And then with financial fair play, even though the rules may change, they are going to have to rely upon outgoings to generate enough money to move too aggressively in the summer window. If we're talking about go out there and spend 200 million or something, which is what they need for four box office sidings. So Frimpong could be one to watch for sure. He's certainly open to the Premier League. And I think that Leverkusen won't stand in his way if the right offer comes. So let's wait and see on that one. I also think we should wait with Frimpong because as I understand it, when Leverkusen come to England to play West Ham in the second leg, Frimpong is likely to speak in some capacity. So we might learn a bit more about his future in the next sort of seven days or so. Interesting stuff. Thank you for that. I mean, moving on to the thoughts of maybe needing outgoings to help fund our transfer window. Casemiro, it was reported earlier that he's likely to leave Manchester United in the summer. Is this something that you see happening and interest from Saudi Arabia there for him? Yeah, I've reported this before. With central midfield and central defence, Manchester United are almost waiting to see who goes first. And then if the midfielders go first, because Ericsson as well could be taken off the wage bill. And I don't think Manchester United had turned down a very competitive offer for Scott McTominay either, but they're not desperate to sell him. So if midfielders go, they move for a midfielder. And that's where Jawa Gomez or Kean and Dewsbury Hall come into the mix and the latter might be available at value for under 30 million depending on what happens with Leicester's finances and Leicester's season and if they get promoted or not and similarly if it's a Varane, Maguire and so on then they'll put a lot of their resources and efforts to strengthening first in central defence in an ideal world they'd want a left back a centre back a central midfielder or a defensive midfielder somebody like an Elise and a experienced or prolific striker to help support Rasmus Hoyland, but you're not going to get all of them in one window. So that's the wish list. But the prioritization of that wish list will depend on outgoings and who departs first. With Casemiro, I think there's a realistic chance that he leaves the football club for the right offer. It's unclear yet whether he wants to go to Saudi Arabia. But one thing's for sure, Saudi dealmakers are looking at Casemiro. He's on their list. And I would expect Saudi to make an offer. The club will be determined last because this is how these unique Saudi deals with box office targets often work. But the feeling is that Al Hilal might be in the mix for Casemiro. So no offer yet. Not clear if the player wants to go, but I do expect Saudi dealmakers to try. And if they make a good offer, then I would expect Manchester United to accept as well. Interesting stuff. I mean, talks of Joe Gomez there. I really do like him as a player, but obviously it all just depends on on the money that Manchester mm. United gets for 
for, for the different midfielders that could be on the way out. I mean, you speak about a left back there. I mean, it's so important that Manchester United go for a left back in the summer. We're told a young left back that isn't going to be too expensive. I mean, Kirkes from Bournemouth has been mentioned a few times. Do you think he is on the list and is that sort of the profile that Man United are looking at? Yeah, that's the profile that they're looking at for sure. And I think that Kirkes is one to watch for Manchester United and Chelsea. It's unclear whether he'd want to leave Bournemouth so soon into his tenure, but sometimes opportunity just presents itself. Mm. And as long as you're guaranteed the pathways and the game time, then you don't turn it down. But that's key again, coming back to Ten Hag's role. If you get a player like Kirkes, is he going to get immediate game time or is he going to find himself a squad player look at Lewis Hall at Newcastle hasn't had that much game time but he wasn't getting it at Chelsea either whereas with Kirkas he's playing for Bournemouth relatively regularly and impressing if he moves to Manchester United is it too early so that will be a consideration but Kirkas is being scouted not that that means a great deal but Manchester United and Chelsea are tracking the player. It might be 2024, it might be 2025. I also wouldn't rule out the possibility of somebody like Mark Kukurea. Won't go down particularly well with Manchester United fans, but cast your mind back to the mm. loan possibility. And it wasn't really Manchester United pulling out of that. It was more down to the fact that Pochettino wanted to use Kukurea and Chelsea also didn't necessarily want to put a mid-season break clause in, which is what Manchester United were able to get with Regulon. So he's still there. And if Chelsea need to sell, Manchester United may look at that and say, on paper, if you use the price that Chelsea play, paid, he's almost 60 million. So if you're offering less than half that and Chelsea are prepared to sell, have you got a bargain with a player that could still reach a higher ceiling? So I'm not saying anything's advanced at that point, but that type of profile and that kind of opportunism and that kind of value for a player like Kukurea, and he can also play centre-back as well if required, he could be one to watch still, only because we know that Manchester United would have done that deal on the right terms with Chelsea, but instead they moved on to regular. Interesting stuff. Also, Girona left back. I think it's Miguel Ortega, is it? Is he somebody that to look at? Perhaps. I think that Girona are braced for offers there. I'm not aware of any approach at this point. So it's certainly not advanced or developed, but it tells you that targets are starting to be drawn up now. Maybe if we'd have done this interview two, three weeks ago, I'd have reported what I've said all along, which is that there are pre-existing targets being tracked as part of due diligence, but there aren't that many concrete names yet that Ratcliffe's team have actually said, OK, we're going for those names. Alise is one that has that sort of universal rubber stamp from old regime, new regime, if we can call it that, whereas virtually every other name that's being linked with Manchester United, no final determination has been made on yet because, again, coming back to what I said before, Wilcox hasn't started, Ashworth hasn't started, Barada hasn't started. So it's quite hard to understand what direction Manchester United at this stage is going to move in the market. And I know that doesn't get as many clicks and I know that doesn't create as many headlines, but it is just the reality. If these key names haven't started, then of course they've not made final determinations. But what you can do is use data in your scouting department to shortlist. And what you can do is start understanding who's available, who might want to join and what price they'll be. And then you kind of have to leave everything on pause to understand what the new senior decision makers think and also what the budget's going to be, which will obviously be impacted by what kind of European football, if any, Manchester United get and what they can bring in from outgoings. And until we understand that, the puzzle of recruitment this summer won't be particularly clear. In terms of strikers, we were told that United weren't sure whether they wanted to go for an experienced striker or a younger type striker. Obviously, Ivan Tony's name keeps coming up as someone with a year left on the deal, experienced and could get him at quite a good price. But then there's younger strikers' names being linked, like Xerxes, who probably looks like he's going to Milan now, mm. to be fair, and Sesco as well, who has a release clause. I mean, what's your feeling on what type of striker United might go for this summer? Yeah, I think Rasmus Hoyland's purple patch has changed Manchester United's perspective and they feel confident that he'll grow from strength to strength. So however he finishes up this season, there's a feeling within Manchester United that he'll better those numbers next season. And then there's a lot of other players around Rashford's uh, position or Martial or Garnacho or Anthony that 
haven't really chipped in enough. And maybe the feeling is that strengthening with an Elise or finding some form from someone within the squad can also help support Rasmus Hoyland. And as a result, Manchester United now feel, as far as I'm told anyway, that they don't need that ultra experienced, hit the ground running, mid late 20s type player. And we know in January that Eric Maxim Chupamoting at 35 was a player that Manchester United really liked as a stopgap. But now they don't need that veteran, that experience, and they certainly won't go in that direction. Tony might be a possibility simply because he'd be a good fit with Manchester United. He's open to that move. And in addition to that, if the price is as low as some suggest, and I'm not so sure, but if the price has dropped as low as some reports suggest, then that is suddenly a deal that Manchester United can afford and he becomes available at value. I'm still not so sure. Some reports have got Tony listed at 30, 35 million. I, I think can't it believe will be that. Higher personally. than that. I can't believe that either. I think that it might, total package, end up being double that still. And suddenly you think Manchester United might go in a different direction. The other thing about Tony is there's no guarantee that he goes this summer. I think there's a realistic possibility that he goes and it will be intriguing to see the price. But there's also this possibility that he stays at Brentford one more season and then becomes available as a free agent in 2025. And that's when I think that Manchester United might look to pounce as well. So we can't rule Tony out of Manchester United's thinking, but let's wait and see what the final price is because personally I'd be surprised if it's as low as that 30 million number that somebody uh, has reported recently. Uh, Xerxes, I think you're right, more likely Milan, but there are Premier League clubs that are looking. Sesco is the one that really intrigues me because I think he'd be another good fit for Manchester United and there's a release clause there, uh, relative market value as well, and maybe the interested parties will just use that as a yardstick and try and get a different structure on the deal. So I think that Manchester United will be in the race for Sesco uh, along with, I'm told, Arsenal and Chelsea and potentially PSG. So with three of the four clubs that are very seriously looking at Sesco, statistically, you've got a 75% chance of him moving to the Premier League. And I would expect Manchester United to be in that conversation. And the other one that Ineos really like is Evan Ferguson. But again, price is going to be a, a big issue. There's been no approach yet, but Brighton don't tend to put a number so it's not like you can just go to Brighton as Manchester United, even though you see numbers in the media and say, what will Ferguson cost? You have to just make a kind of blind offer usually with Brighton. And given the money that they've got for several signings, but most recently, 100 million plus for Moises Caicedo, even though his form's not been great this season, I think you'd need minimum, minimum 80 million for Evan Ferguson. And that's probably out of Manchester United's price range. Yeah, I keep hearing that we're big fans of Ferguson, but it's unfortunate because I think Brighton will just stick a huge, huge number on him and we won't be able to go near it. But you just mentioned Elise there, dead quickly. Do you think that's like not nailed on, but do you think that's a very high likelihood that that deal is going to happen for United in the summer? Yeah, I think so. It's a strange one in many ways because they want a striker, they're going to need a centre-back, they might need a defensive midfielder. We know left-backs are priority. Mm -hmm. and How many just people a are we versatile... <laughs> Exactly, and Elise is going to have a much bigger price than his previous release clause before he extended at Crystal Palace. So I think they like the profile, but it might just be a case of, is that the priority? And Arguably, it is in the sense that there's a lot of players in that position not performing at Manchester United. So once again, can they ship out these players? Can they get them off the wage bill? Can they bring in some good fees to raise that 100 million plus? And then how do they want to allocate it? And when we say 100 million plus, my understanding, as I said a couple of answers ago, is that you're looking at maybe 70 or 80 million to try and get a couple of players for maximum 100 million. But ideally, 70 to 80 million, bring in two, like they did last summer with Mason Mount and Anana. Then if they can bring in 100, 150 million in outgoings, you start to think we can bring in four or five senior players. And then Elise enters the equation. But if, as of now, we said, you've only got that 70 to 80 million, where do you want to strengthen? I'm not convinced that they'd be dipping into their pocket for Elise first. I think it's striker, out and out, traditional striker, one, and then two, just depends on who goes. We know that Martial is leaving. We're not so sure about Anthony. 
Greenwood, I think, is still more likely that they're going to get a fee for. So that might allow them to move in the market as well. And then we have to wait and see. And if they are to get Casemiro off the wage bill and bring in a fee, if they are to get Ericsson off the wage bill, if they do get a good offer for McTominay, if Maguire leaves, if Varane comes off the wage bill rather than taking diminished terms, they've actually got quite a lot of assets to work with. And remember, it's not just about fees. It's about if Varane leaves, that frees up a fair amount of budget because he's one of the higher earners mm. at the football club. So there is that flexibility, but it's going to take time. And in a summer where we've got Euros and we've got Olympics, not everything might happen in the first few weeks of the window. But I think if Manchester United can possibly find the finances and create the space in their wage bill and in their squad for a player like Elise, I think they'll enter that conversation. But if they're forced to make an either or choice between Elise and a striker, I think they will put their time and energy and budget first on that striker. And that might just allow somebody else to pounce for Elise first. So let's wait and see. But if we're only talking perfect worlds, budget, no object, then absolutely Manchester United would be in the conversation for Elise. And he's also very keen on that move. Yes, Ben, thank you. Just literally have one minute left. So I wanted to just ask you, as a centre-back for Manchester United, is there any names out there that you think Manchester United will go for? Just really quickly, because we're going to run out of time. Yeah, I think most of them are out there already. We know about Todibo, and that is technically Ratcliffe talking to Ratcliffe, but... Remember, the problem is fair market value. So the concerns are on the books once again. It's not a case of Manchester United being able to underpay to Nice. So he's going to cost this 40, 45 million. It might even be as high as 60 million euros, which is a little bit closer to 50 million. But he may be there on the conversation. I don't think they're looking at Tar. I know some have put Max Kilman even into the conversation, which is quite interesting. And I know that Manchester United have scouted him. Tottenham are looking at Kilman as well and with Wolves' financial situation there might be a window of opportunity there Ignacio is another one to watch as well so we're at the point with centre-back where Manchester United haven't got a singular fixed target they've not got to that point again I know it's boring to say but it is the reality at this stage maybe if we speak again in May it will be a little bit different but that's where we're at and centre-back may not be the first thing they move for if Varane stays at the club if Maguire stays at the club. It's going to be quite hard to get rid of Maguire before the Euros because he'll be focused on that as well. So there's a lot of moving parts, but those are the names that I'm hearing. Thank you very much, Ben. Great answers as per usual. Can't wait to chat to you more as the summer transfer window progresses, but thank you for all the updates. Brilliant insight as usual. Look forward to it as ever and good luck for the rest of the season. Thank you, Ben. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers. Thank you everyone for watching. That was Ben Jacobs with updates on this summer transfer window and Manchester United's current manager situation. Let me know all your thoughts down in the comments if you enjoy these videos, what sort of questions you want asking next time. Have a lovely day everyone. Hope you enjoyed it and we will see you on the next one.